I have a new series called Tito Teach of Sales, and I've been writing for Sales Hacker a lot. A lot of my blog posts are number one SEO on Google, which is really, really cool. So I've also been a user of outreach um, for about two years, and I, I love it. The more important part about me is that I started as an SDR in 2012, and I've risen through all the ranks. So I was making 120 calls back in 2012, then I was managing a team of four, a team of eight, then I had 15, 27 under me, then I had a role as an AE, I've been in sales ops, I've done it all in regards to sales development. So hopefully, not only do I bring an interesting perspective of somebody who's been there, done that across different roles, but now I'm CEO of a company called LT Sales, and we do essentially sales development as a service. So we build the sales development teams for a lot of like really cool companies. Um, and we've operationalized and used a lot of my learnings to, to see how we work today. So hopefully I can share insights with you that will be helpful. Um, we're going to cover three things today because we only have half an hour. So we're going to talk a little bit about the value of sales development, what the sales development journey is like, and how great leaders actually help SDRs. And that's what the meat of the, of the uh, presentation is about. I want to talk a little bit about like, the value of sales development because I think a lot of people have it wrong. So who knows um, who this guy is on the picture right here? Very few people. But I bet if I tell you his name, you recognize him. That is Nikola Tesla, right? And one thing we don't realize is we all hear about Tesla, and he was a great inventor, but he died in 1943 with a lot of debt. And I think that the reason he died with a lot of debt is because he didn't have an outbound SDR. <laughs> he had the best ideas, the best products, the best things he built, but unfortunately, he had nobody to help him get the ideas out there and start you know, help the world implement his ideas. And it's not only me who believes this. Peter Thiel said that pure di poor distribution of product is, this, is the single most important cause of failure, right? If you can get a channel to work out, you have a great business, but if you don't, you're finished. So first thing to understand is sales development is incredibly valuable. And when I think about that, I think of maybe three different industries. Let's say pilots, web developers, or coders, and SDRs. Things that they have in common is that they really matter for the experience of our prospects or clients, and that their job is incredible, incredibly valuable. The other thing that's also that they have in common is that the difference between a really good one and a really bad one can make or break your business. Right? We would never go to an airline and say, OK, um, who's my pilot? OK, he has no training. OK, no pilot license. Doesn't matter. Right? I'll just uh, hop in. Let's, let's take the flight. That would be insane. Just like nobody here or no company here would ever hire a kid out of college to lead the development of their application. Imagine if the lead developer of, of outreach was some right out of college kid. Even worse, right out of college kid with a philosophy degree and no coding experience. But that's what we do with sales development. We hire people who have no training, no education. They don't know what they're doing. And we give them a phone and a computer and we are, hey, you're going to run the most important motion for our go-to-market strategy. Uh, just Get some meetings, right? <laughs> Complete disrespect for the role, for one, but the problem that that creates is that SDRs follow their intuition, right? I followed my intuition. I want to ask people, what happens when you follow your intuition? Well, if I follow my intuition, the earth is flat, right? So we, we get a lot of things wrong by just following our intuition. Um, another thing that I hear is that you know SDRs uh, or people out there, you, we're looking for confirmation bias unintentionally. So we try to go find things that confirm what we already believe. So I have a lot of SDRs come tell me when they, when they don't have a good training, they say, I read on LinkedIn that cold calling is dead. And I show him this picture, I say, okay, well, is the gym dead? Are you not so sure? Or is the gym not dead? And who do you want to be? Right? So let's start talking a little bit more about the problems with the SDR journey, right? When you start your job as an SDR, and as a leader, when you bring an SDR kind of like on, on your team. What does that look like and, and how does that work? To start with that, I want to talk a little bit about the journey of learning. Let's think about when we were learning to like ride a bike, right? You don't just get on a bike, you're like, oh, I saw these people on TV, the Red Bull challenge of downhill, and you hop on your bike and you go down the hill. You don't do that, right? You put the training wheels on, your dad grabs the bike, you hop on, and you go slowly, and you pedal a little bit, and you start the motions. And little by little, we start taking off the training wheels. Then maybe we even take off the helmet because we're so sure we're not going to screw it up, right? Maybe another thing we learn later on in life is poker. And this is a, a good analogy that I'm going to reuse later on in the talk. But it's like, when you don't know how to play poker, and a lot of people learn how to play poker as adults, right? 
When you don't know how to play, you just mess up all the time. Then you learn the basics. Okay, 2-7 is the worst hand, you're gonna fold. Ace-King, good hand, you're gonna bet. However, if that's all you learn, you're gonna lose still all the time, or most of the time. And the reason being is, poker is not only about what you have, but to get to the next level, you need to understand what do you have in context to what the other people have. If you do that, you're better. You know how you get better? If you know what you have, you figure out what, you try to figure out what the others have, but you also try to figure out what they think that you have. And even better, when you look at your cards, you know what you have, you know what, you try to figure out what they have, you try to figure out what they think you have, and you try to figure out what they think that you think that they have. Now you're in the big leagues, right? Um, however, what happens when you bring in a, a somebody to play poker, you're a poker master, you're like, okay, you're new to poker, you know nothing, okay, let's sit down, do this. Try to figure out what they think that you think that they think you have, you're screwed. You have no idea. You gotta learn the basics, and just like you learn how to ride a bike, you gotta start taking the training wheels off little by little. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that journey and how we help SDRs get better. The other thing about getting better is that we need to understand what's the process of getting better. What are we measuring? What is better, right? So a lot of SDRs that I talk to that don't really have a good manager or trainer or a good leader, they tell me, I've A-B tested my template. And I'm like, you've A-B tested your template. How many, how many times did you send it to each sample group? He's like, well, I sent it four times here, three times here, and then I got a response here, so it's clearly better, right? So I take out the dice, and I'm like, okay, let's roll the dice with your right hand three times and four times with your left hand, and now we obviously know that your right hand is useless because obviously you've gotten better rolls with the left hand, right? So we should just discard you. Let's cut that one off, right? It doesn't work. It's ridiculous. So another thing is have control over the data and understand what's the process of getting better and keep control of that as you help your SDRs get trained and not until they understand the idea of like statistical significance and sample sizes and so on can we, can we get it back to them. So some of the lessons learned in the common problems are that you need to start your SDRs with a define and control process and slowly take off the training walls. You have to have a proven methodology, methodology to teach them um, and not just let them do whatever they wish or look at confirmation bias and avoid cold calling or things like that. And finally, you gotta control the statistics and figure out what works and what doesn't for your team. And you gotta get very scientific about it. So let's talk about how great leaders actually help SDRs. What's their day to day, what do they do, how do they hire, train, retain, and so on. First, I wanna talk about SDR coaching because I think this is like the biggest thing that people are getting wrong. The first thing you gotta do is make sure that your SDRs understand their data. The way we think about this is we have done things like build a call funnel, right? So every week, this is week by week, the SDR has come back to their one-on-one -on -one and brought their data for phone and email, right? And with that phone and email, we build a funnel. So this is a cold call funnel. We have the number of dials, dials a day, number of connections, connections per day. I have, you know, put, I'm not, I'm not gonna show exactly the naming conventions that we use or how we think about it, but in a certain sense, you can understand that it's connections, then like quick conversations. Did you get hung up at hello? Like, hey, this is John calling for whatever, right? Oh no, uh, I don't wanna talk to you, I'm not interested, click. Well, we wanna figure out how many times did they stuck there, right? Or do they go to the next level, which is like, oh sure, what do you have? You give, them a, you give them a little bit of a value prop, you tell them why you're calling, they respond back, a little bit of conversation. If you get stuck there, we wanna know that. Or if you like go in a very in-depth conversation, even offer a meeting and then get, get that declined, you maybe got stuck at the next level. And with this, you can build a funnel and start understanding what percentage of the time each SDR is getting stuck where, and what are your funnel metrics conversion rates looking like? If you're able to do that, now you can do really cool things because you can set the, the benchmarks for your team and start thinking, okay, wait a second. So one of my SDRs just had 16 conversations this week that, that were really in depth. They went back and forth and he was unable to book meetings. He only got one meeting over the phone. So you go back to outreach, you look at your custom dispositions, you go in there and you start listening to the calls and you start coaching. And the only way you can coach your SDRs on how to cold call is if you're really good at cold calling. So you grab, Chad's a really good trainer, he'll, he'll go grab his SDR, listen to the calls and say, ah, your tone of voice is off. You're like, hey, do you have two minutes? You gotta, you gotta be stronger, you gotta have authority, you gotta have, you know, things like that. So if you get really good at what you do, and if you have a good trainer in-house, and I think this is the biggest value you can have, is a great trainer in-house. You can coach him and teach him how to get really good at cold calling. I think that sales development is more like a sport. I don't think we need managers. 
I think we just need coaches, right? We don't, it, it's more like you're on the field, you're doing stuff, and then you come back, we coach, you go back on the field, right? It's like we're, we're, we're life all the time. It's like soccer or football. We're not like managing, you know, Peyton Manning. We're coaching Peyton Manning. So some of the things that I think about is, again, SDR, SDRs don't need managers, they need coaches. And the great leaders, um, you know, are really good at what they do, but they, te they, they choose to teach instead. They choose to take that role where they're gonna go grab a lot of new SDRs and teach them the process, take off the training wheels, help them get better constantly. Um, and they're looking at metrics, they're listening to a few calls, they're trying to figure out what are the bottlenecks, and they're enabling their team to get better constantly. That is the only way that you can build a sustainable and scalable sales development team that doesn't have a manager that's just like coming back and saying, oh, make more calls, make more calls. Like that doesn't help. So we really gotta inspect that further. The way we think about it is every new SDR that joins our company, we train them three times a week. They have two training sessions plus their one-on-one. -on -one. And then as they get better and better and better, and as, as they understand their own metrics, they can self-coach themselves so they can learn with our own resources. And then we, we you know, pull that back a little bit. Now they have an hour-long one-on-one and a 30 minutes. But our SDR to manager ratio is usually one to six, and it doesn't exceed one to eight. And I hear every company has like one manager to 15 or 20 reps. There's no way that you have time for coaching if you think about it that way. So that's a good lesson to, to take away. Um, another one is like how we manage one-on-ones. Like what are you doing with your reps? I hear so many people telling me, oh, the SDR is a transactional role, you just come in here for a few months and then you're out. And trust me, I have SDRs on my team who have been with us for four years and they never wanna leave. I don't understand the difference between SDRs and AEs. If you operationalize your role correctly and if you think about it the same way, I know AEs who have been AEs for 20 years. Why don't we have SDRs who, have, who wanna be SDRs for 20 years? There's a few reasons. But, and I'm gonna cover some of them here, it starts a little bit with the one-on-one. -on -one. So a couple of things that I think that every team should do. You gotta, you gotta get feedback regarding their happiness and how their work's going. So every week on one-on-ones we ask him, what's going well, what do you need help with? And then, how are we doing? How are we doing to enable you? Are we coaching you? Do you feel like you're getting all the help you need to become the person you wanna become? to be the sales leader you wanna to be, to perform the way you need to perform, and then how well do you think you're doing? And we use this constant feedback to help him get better and better and better. And also, I manage a, a few SDR managers, I am getting that data back to me and understanding which SDRs need a little bit more help so I can go and continue to coach my team and help my team. And I think this is fundamental. The second thing is that I think the compensation model is broken. We thought that, or we think that SDR should be operated in the same way as AEs. And statistics say from the Bridge Group and Topo and whatever other places that only 60% you know, of AEs are hitting their quota, and we're thinking we can do the same with SDRs. We give him a pretty bad salary, pretty bad OT, and we still like, only have 60% of the team hit quota. And what happens is these SDRs are used to you know, being in college or whatever, where they're like, okay, the minimum you need to like, be okay, you need a C minus and they're used to getting Bs and As. So when you tell them that they're, like, they're on tar target earnings, if they do what they need to do, they're gonna make 80K in San Francisco. They come in thinking, I'm gonna crush it, I'm gonna do super well, I'm gonna get to 80, 90, 100K. And what ends up happening in most companies is that they don't hit it. So the way we think about it is, you should build your comp plan for SDRs in a way where, and this is literally one of ours, and uh, this is an average performer, this is not a top performer, where they are tracking to 107% of goal, and they will make the money they're promised. And if you do that, I promise you they're not gonna leave as soon as they're leaving in many other companies. And it's all about like taking off the training wheels, but also giving visibility. So at the beginning, we don't let SDRs do anything. You follow our cold calling scripts, you're gonna read it. And we're gonna write all your emails. And you have no say over what you do, or if cold calling is dead, or if the earth is flat. You just do as we say. But wait a second. We want you to take a lot of notes about all your ideas because three months from now, you're gonna get promoted to a team member. And as a team member, you can bring ideas to your manager and we're happy to test them. And we're gonna test those and if they're good, we're actually gonna like give you props and be very excited about your ideas. Later on, six to nine months later, you can get promoted to a leadership contributor. And in that role, you can test whatever you want because you've learned about statistical significance and there's not three three emails here, four here, this one works better. It's about a thousand emails here, a thousand emails there, what actually works better. 
And it's not just like, this one gets a higher open rate. It's how many meetings did you source from that email? And how many people did you piss off from that email? And on the other side, what happened with the other template? And if you think about it that way, you're going to get better. And finally, I like calling the next role assistants rather than team leads. Team leads creates a very weird dynamic where when you're an SDR, get promoted to team lead, it sucks. Are you still on the same level? Are you still my friend? Can we get drunk on the weekend together now that we work here? Or, or wait a second, are you now my manager? But hey, if you give me too many things that I need to do, or you tell me like what I need to do, I'm gonna, I can just say you're not my manager. So we hate the we team lead idea. We call them assistants, and you get quota relief, and you're learning new skills. Um, regarding their promotions, like build a path. What do they need to do? What is their checklist? And we talk about these monthly. Hey, you need to get. You know, we have a point system internally because that matters to us. Uh, we we have SDRs across different campaigns and different companies. But you can say you need to get X many qualified opportunities. And then you need to, like, how to use outreach tests. And then you need to pass an intermediate call calling test without script. And then you got to read X books. And you got to do this, get this certification. And then you know that if you get to the next level, you're going to unlock different things. So you're building a promotion path intentionally, and you're checking in with them regarding their progress monthly. Guess what? Now, they don't come to you like, you either promote me or I'm leaving. They know exactly what they need to do, and it's all clear, and we've set the right expectations. So that really matters for SDRs. I want to hop on to another topic, which is operations. And a lot of people might be thinking, what the hell is EADD? EADD stands for Eliminate, Automate, Delegate, Do. And it's the mindset that we have internally, and I think every company should have when it comes to like, how do they operationalize their SDR team to excellence. First thing is that we give SDRs too many tasks. It's like, OK, SDRs, so you're going to research the personas. You can set up your own tools if you want to. Uh, you're going to define target accounts, create sequences, blah, 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 this and that, this and that. And it's crazy, because as, as leaders, we think this is what's happening. The SDR is hyper-organized, and just like, you know, a lot of people are talking about time management on LinkedIn, right? There's a few coaches there, oh, you got to structure your day so that you can accomplish nine things every day for 11% of your time. That doesn't happen. This is the average SDR at a badly run company. It's like 20% of the time they're actually working, 20% of the time they're like stressed out, researching some personas. And the other 60% they are like trying to figure out how, how they get out of this company. <laughs> Somehow. Or give me an A roll. And it's a terrible idea. So I want to use the analogy of EADD, eliminate, automate, delegate, do, to teach you a little bit more about how we've operationalized our lead research process in five steps. The first thing you think is, do I really, really, really need this, or can I get away from it with not doing it at all? Data research, we really need it. So we can't just eliminate it. Automate it. So the mindset is, OK, I really know how this process works. I'm the leader of the company, or I'm the SDR manager. Let me go research 50 leads and figure out what is the motion. What do I need to do? What websites do I go to? What tools am I using? And as you do it, think about the mindset of how much of this can, I, can be actually fully automated through tools or anything like that. What can be automated should be automated. What can't be automated should be delegated, right? And you should find a high quality, low cost resource to do it. So the way we think about it is we've hired people in South American Philippines for $6 an hour to follow all our lead research process. Our SDRs hardly ever touch data. All the data is being fueled to their plate. And it's not like data that you can regularly buy online. It might be like a quarterly report. Or you know, one of our campaigns, we're reaching out to universities. We're trying to figure out the colors of the university and their mascot and things like that, because on the email, it says, you know, go Blue Devils. So you can't just buy that data from Zoom in for anywhere else. Sometimes you need to do manual process, and you can, you can hire somebody who can do the job very well at a low cost and enable your SDRs. And finally, have the SDRs only do the things that can't be delegated to a lower cost resource. And with that, you're going to have the happiest team on Earth. right? It's almost like an AE role. You come in, you just have conversations. You dial and you do all that. And you, can get, you need to get pretty organized. So this is like how we help our data research team in the Philippines. Like, do their role well, right? We're giving them the geographies, the titles, the, t the seniorities. Like we're really orienting them, and we're working on Google Sheets so we can control exactly as they fill the data, and we can understand are they doing the job well or are they messing up, right? So it's a lot about the operations. And finally, if you start thinking about your operations this way, this is what your team's going to look like. 
Defining the target accounts is going to be done by executive leadership. The research is going to be done by a data research team abroad for $6 an hour. Your sequences and strategy are done by leadership. They understand the conversion rates. They understand statistics. They understand statistical significance, what's working, what's not. The SDR only needs to reach out, secure meetings, and make sure those, follow, uh, those show up. You have an SLA in place that tells you what meetings are qualified and which ones are not. And finally, you, your bias journey starts with your AE. And this relieves all the stress from the SDR hating to do their job because they have to do so much data research or their meetings don't get accepted and things like that. Unfortunately, I have half an hour, so I can't talk too, too in depth about this. Let's talk a little bit about incentives. This is another area where so many people are getting it wrong. Why? Because we love spiffs. And I don't know where this came from, but every sales development team is like they're giving out gift cards, they're giving out whatever, like $100 bills, whatever. It's a really bad practice. My background is in human psychology and behavioral economics. And one thing we know from human psychology and behavioral economics very well is that in, if you incentivize effort in the short term by just telling people to crack more phones or send more emails or work longer hours, it works. You increase performance by 10%. What happens the next day when there's no incentive? It goes down 20%. And now your net net is negative. So you giving spiffs and gift cards and things like that is destroying your culture. And your SDRs are hungry for money because you're paying them shit. So pay them more and don't do spiffs. Okay, but you want a team that's excited about what's coming on and how they can like earn things. Well, you have your promotions. They're unlocking things that they can now do later on. They're checking off their checklist for their promotion. And more importantly, something we do is we run quarterly precedence club. Every three months you hit your quota, we're gonna fly you down to Cancun for the weekend. We're gonna fly you to Cabo or Colombia. We're gonna have, it's not super expensive, you're gonna be in a three-star hotel. But guess what, they don't care, they're SDRs. Most of them are young, they're, they're grinding. Three-star hotel, let's go to Colombia. Let's do one fun activity, let's go swim with whale sharks. Then you get Sunday off, well you got Friday off, right? Saturday we do the, we fly in, we have nice dinner, steak, Champagne, beautiful. They take their pictures, put it all over Instagram. All their friends are jealous, mission accomplished. Saturday, they go swim with the whale sharks. Friends are jealous again. Sunday, they have the day off, they fly back. Monday, they're on their phones. And then all their peers are like, that looked amazing, I wanna go next time. Oh yeah, it's 11 weeks away, not 11 months away. 11 months away doesn't get me excited. 11 weeks away, I get right on the phone, I wanna crush my quota, right? So think about it that way. Uh, finally, like hiring top SDRs, how do you do it? The way we do it is we actually do a lot of like mock exercises. We think this is very, very important. We do mock calls, sample emails, sample voicemails. And the other very important thing is be very honest about the role. So many companies are like, we're venture funded, we raised X many million, we're a billion dollar company, we have the best culture in Glassdoor. And then when they come in, it's like a whole mess for the SDR role, right? Um, and then they're like, okay, so you need to make like, why don't you make like 60 calls a day? And they're like, no, I, I heard cold calling is dead. And it's just like a very dysfunctional structure. So be, be very honest, right? So we ask in our interview process, hey, Johnny, how are you going to stay fresh making 120 calls a day? We've set the expectation that they're going to come in and make 120 calls a day. And the other thing we set the expectation for is we have the best training in the world. You're going to come here, you're going to commit to be an SDR for 18 months. And by the time you graduate, you're going to be the best sales professional you can ever be. We're going to give you all the resources. We're really going to help you out. We're really investing in you. And that's what we call ROTI, return on time invested. We want your commitment as an SDR that if you join our organization, this is the best time investment you can make in your career. By the time you graduate, you're going to be better off than any other decision you could make right now for your career. So with that, we have the key takeaways. Coach based on metrics and let SDRs have visibility. Deliver on your OTE promises. Build a career path and talk about it monthly. You know, take off the training wheel slowly. Operationalize your team to, ex uh, to excellence using EADD. Make the job fun through good pay, fun incentives, but no spiffs. And be honest about the work, the career opportunities, the culture, and everything else. And if you follow those, you'll get to our mindset where we think that if we take care of our people, they'll take care of our business. That's it. Thank you so much.
Obviously, we're hiring. And um, cool. Before that, I'll, I'll take questions. Why not? I see. One over there. Um, best opportunities for automation. I mean. It, it depends where you're at, right? Because you're at outreach, uh, you already have a few of these happening, right? So your sequences, your cadences, but also like your triggers in marketing. Like how are they responding to an inbound lead or things like that? Or the lead research, right? Are you just augmenting the data directly? Or are they like going on Zoom Info themselves and finding the phone number and copy pasting and going back to the other system, right? Do you have a, just a rotating chair integration? Do you actually have your systems working behind the scenes? Outreach is already a great step. I mean, I can't tell you how many companies I talk to that are like, oh yeah, we just create tasks on Salesforce and make dials and it's crazy. So outreach is a good step, but you gotta look at your team and like I said, you gotta just use the eliminate, automate, delegate, do framework in your mind and try to see where your team can benefit from it. No, no it's not that like all teams are the same. I was super excited. I've been waiting all week for someone to talk about uh, prospecting automation. You're literally the only person that's talked about it this week. I'm just curious, since it is, it can suck up about 60% of a BDR's day researching and prospecting and building out account maps and that kind of thing. Do you have any recommendations for vendors that are doing this? Because I know a lot of vendors like, you know, ones you mentioned, ZoomInfo, others, they really just offer the data, but they don't offer the customized data, the actual account maps that BDR's need to kind of have that as more assembly line type process. So I've, I've built 30 SDR teams in my career, right? And, and right now the company I run, we build SDR teams for companies. We either like from scratch or they already have a process, they have some SDRs, we augment their team. I can tell you that every time there's a lot of custom things. Like we have a company that does like image optimization, pixel perfect images so your website's faster and whatever. Like the insights we wanna gather about their technographic data and about their current processes and the marketing automation they use, some of that you can somewhat buy but nobody has perfect data. So automate as much as possible, but what you can't automate, you gotta delegate. So hire a few people in Philippines or South America or find somebody and have them go, you build the process. Like you go, you research 30 accounts, and then you're gonna be like, fuck man, this job sucks. Yeah. And you know what you're gonna do after? You're gonna create a very strict process for how you follow that. You're gonna go to South America. I was born and raised in Bolivia. Most of my friends who are 25 to 30, they make about $1,000 a month, right? So you start paying them $8 an hour, and boy, they're rich. They don't care about doing this like pretty crappy work all day, because literally, who do you work for? Oh, I work for this American company, and I make 1,500 bucks. So I, like guess my, I guess my question is, how can I get introduced to these, <laughs> these uh, South Americans? <laughs> I mean, like who, like, who are like the vendors? Who are the vendors that you'd recommend to do that? No, no vendors, go hire people, go on. Uh, freelance.com, ework.com, upwork.com, go, go find, go interview people, ask them, do, do a test, right? So the way we hire people for Philippines is we give them a test of 50 leads, we give them some tools, we're like, go. And we give the same test for the same leads. We already have their data, we just delete their data, give them a sample, we're like, go, research. We hire 10 people to do the exact same task, it takes $10 per person. They do it, they bring it back, we compare. Okay, yep, good. This one, not so good. This one? Oh, as good as the other one. Okay, which one was faster? This one was faster, we're paying hourly, we'll take this one, done. And then just build an army. We have an army of people right now, and we're just growing that team and growing that team. And that's why sometimes I go to clients, they have four SDRs. I'm like, okay, let me augment your team with one. Literally have some clients where I have one SDR, they have four, and my one SDR is booking more meetings than their four combined. I'm like, how do you do that? I'm like, are you coming to outreach? I'll show you. <laughs> So two last things uh, before we shut it down. For the people who have asked questions or if you want free cold calling training, come talk to me. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna allow five people. I'm gonna personally coach you and train you, either you or one of your reps. Uh, if you just come talk to me. Uh, and then this is the post I put on LinkedIn uh, right before my session started. Uh, so if you go comment on it and you let us know, um, let me know what you thought about this talk, that'd be awesome. Uh, Max and Scott, who are in charge of this conference, are definitely watching. Um, and then if I don't get 35 comments, uh, or I guess regardless, I might just go ahead and open a bar top, 500 bucks for anybody who wants. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> cool. Let's give a That's round for it. Tito. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.